video of Hill and Marks. Can everybody hear me? Is that okay, Kay? Yep. yep. Um, so first I wanted to thank uh, four Chambers of Commerce for co-sponsoring this um, really interesting and helpful, we believe, uh, webinar. Uh, the Rensselaer Chamber of Commerce, the Capital District Chamber of Commerce, the Fulton Montgomery Chamber of Commerce, and the New York Upstate Black Chamber of Commerce. Um, and, and we've also partnered with other chambers across the state who have uh, spread the word, so we thank them as well. Um, we thank you all for sharing your time with us. Um, our, our game plan has always been at Hill and Marks is to keep our, our people safe and to keep all of your people safe, uh, your customers and your employees. So um, within that mission, this is, this is uh, a very important webinar uh, for us, for you. Um, we want to give you as much information as possible to help you get your uh, organizations open um, safely because we believe very strongly if you can open your organizations and we can open the community and the economy safely the first time, we don't have to go back, revert back, and then go back out again uh, to reopen the economy. So we want to help everybody do this right the first time and we believe uh, proper cleaning and proper disinfection and proper policies and procedures are really the way uh, forward and the way to really keep everybody safe and, and do this the right way. So, um, so I just I want to thank you so much for being a part of this uh, webinar. Um, want to thank you so much. Uh, if, if you have any other questions after the webinar, our team is here to help support you. Um, we we are a resource always for you, uh, whether you're a customer whether you're not a customer, whether you're um, a school or a hospital or a restaurant or a barber shop, it doesn't matter. We're here to help uh, the community and, and help in any way we can. So Katie, I will let you take it from here logistically. Um, and Brant uh, from ISSA, we thank you so much uh, for being a great partner to us and, um, and to all of our customers and the community. Thank you, Jason, so much. Um, welcome everyone. All I ask is that you please mute yourselves throughout the presentation so we have no distracting or disruptive feedback. And Brandt here has a ton of insightful information that I know you guys are going to be really excited about and, and it's going to make you feel very calm and confident. So Brandt, I will let you take that away. Um, I did want to say that we are recording this webinar and it will be available to download and we will follow up with all of those who signed on today with a, a follow-up email with all of this information for you. Um, so thank you, Jason and Brant. Take it away. All right. Thanks, Katie. Uh, first, everybody, I, I want to say thank you to Hill and Marks and the Packer family really for allowing me to, the opportunity to speak with everyone today. Uh, it's a true honor. And today we're going to focus on the strategic decisions for rebuilding consumer confidence. How does trust, loyalty, credibility, honesty, play a distinct role within your organization. So today I wanna to start by asking a very specific question. And it's, it's up on your, on your slide here, and it's, are you ready to help your customers walk through their emotional journey of trusting your organization? Just as many people decide to buy products in a retail facility or uh, in a restaurant, they decide what plate they wanna buy, a lot of times it's done through an emotional purchase. Now, their journey of going back to your organization and trusting in you is still an emotional one. So quickly about me, uh, my name is Branton Saro. I'm the Director of Education, Training, Certification and Standards globally for ISSA. For the past 15 years, I have been a professional trainer for the Janitorial and Sanitary Supply Association. I focus time on telecommunications, sales, leadership, management, and business development. Currently, my role is to manage the sales and development of programs for education and certifications globally for ISSA with a primary focus on North America. And I've had a distinct honor and pleasure to speak all over Europe, South America, Australia, United States, and Canada. Just some high level notes about ISSA. For those of you that are not familiar with our organization, we are a not-for-profit trade association representing the cleaning industry worldwide. 
we're close to 100 years old. Um, our, our university will actually be in 2023. So the combined total uh, years of experience on this call today between us and Hill and Marks is well over 200 years of experience in the industry. We have over 9,500 corporate members representing 105 different countries. And one of my favorite things to talk about is how many people we touch worldwide. And over the years, we have trained and certified nearly 300,000 cleaning professionals. Um, when you really step back and think about it, ladies and gentlemen, that only represents close to 5% of the total industry uh, when we think about service providers and frontline cleaners. So we have a lot of work ahead of us. Between Hill and Marks and ISSA and all of our, our members, we really try to adhere to a brand promise. And over the years, we focus on changing the way the world views cleaning. And for, for those of you that may know me, and I know the Hill and Marks family knows me well, um, I live and breathe this brand promise every single day that I come to work. And as big of a voice as we have, um, what's really crazy to me to think about as, as an industry professional is that it took a pandemic to change the way the world views cleaning. Uh, we couldn't do it alone, but because of this pandemic, cleaning is no longer a cost center, but it's actually an investment. The people, the tools, your vendors, your suppliers are absolutely vital resources for your future success. So this is not just about COVID-19, but it's also about other serious outbreaks that can occur. So when you think of things like MRSA that could live on a surface for just a few days or up to a few months, you really don't wanna risk it. Invest in your facilities, invest in your people, because you need to have a successful tomorrow. It's, again, it's all about confidence and trust in your capabilities. That is what your consumer is looking for. I wanted to start diving into some content to discuss the state of the economy and some of this content dates back uh, to the beginning or mid-May. And the first thing to highlight here is that the unemployment rate has been hovering around 14 to 15 percent uh, really through this entire pandemic in, in, in the month of May. It's the highest it's been since 1940. And for over 80 years, we've only been averaging an unemployment rate of about 6 percent. Live events such as concerts, sports, trade shows are literally non-existent. When you think of SPAC, they've actually canceled their entire season for the first time that I've ever seen. Schools are unsure if they're gonna reopen in the fall, both colleges, universities, as well as K-12. Even if they have the new CDC guidelines and recommendations, they're unsure of what tomorrow brings. Some, some staggering data that I came across uh, over the past few weeks is that the transportation and hospitality industry is predicted to be a total of 80% lower in revenue compared to this time in 2019, which actually means they're gonna lose about $83 billion. It's a staggering number. And there was other reports back in April uh, that were starting to come out that stated nearly seven and a half million small businesses could shut down because of the pandemic. So these are alarming numbers and I, and I think that this really sets the tone. So let's talk about what consumers thought of prior to COVID-19. And for many years, cleaning was, is important, but it wasn't cleaning and disinfecting or cleaning, disinfecting and decontamination. What was important was the visual. It was, you know, is there soil or dirt on a surface? So 95% of customers felt that cleanliness was the most important factor to shopping and retail. This outweighed things such as proper lighting, proper temperature control, um, advertising, the music, the, the ambiance. It was really focused on cleaning and consumers would say that they would not return back to a retail facility if that facility was dirty. 80% of consumers would avoid a hotel or restaurant if they had a dirty restroom. Again, it shows the impact of cleaning. 64% of consumers claimed 
that dining room tables and chairs inside of a restaurant were the most annoying thing that they would come across inside of a restaurant. And when you think of the customer journey from the point of entrance inside of a restaurant, they spend the most time sitting at that dining room table and at their bench or in their chairs. And the most common thing that we've noticed nationally at ISSA when, in the restaurant industry that can cause this is that the wait staff is not trained, they're not educated, they're not certified. So they would typically take the same cloth and wipe every single surface without changing cloth or changing the dirty solution, which ultimately would create cross-contamination. The consumers see this uh, and they would actually state, we will not come back to that facility if these things remain dirty. Things are now shifting today. Uh, the consumers are unsure of the future. We don't know as consumers what's going to happen tomorrow or months from now. But what we do know is we want to go back to a quote unquote normal. And I'm going to use the words normal in quotations quite often through this presentation because what is truly normal? Consumers, they're ready to spend some money. Uh, their discretionary income has actually been uh, put away. They've been saving it over the last few months. We want to go out and spend. Uh, we want to go back out to dinner. We want to go to an event. But 20% of those consumers are starting to say it could take more than a year before things become back to the quote unquote normal. And we still don't feel safe being in large gatherings. And as you see New York State and other states open up in phases, they're limiting the size of gatherings that we can have. Um, I think just recently New York State opened up uh, religious gatherings of 10 or less. It will take time for those things to expand to 50 or 100 plus. So what will things look like when we reopen? So as I mentioned, normal uh, no longer exists, but the new normal as we will know it is on the way. And we're slowly in the middle of this now, it's slowly progressing, but consumers are naturally adopting to uh, the new ways of purchasing or the normal ways of purchasing for today. And they're, they're actually seeing that some grocers are having an increase of 40 to 50% of online purchases. And it's not just grocers, it's, it's retail, it's distribution, it's across the board. Those individuals that have been nervous about buying things online now being forced to do so. You may see schools alternate days and times for students. You're going to see live events take place without any fans in the audience. And there's things that you could see that we're um, starting to watch happening over in Asia where some organizations will require temperature checks before entering the facility. They're going to require personal protective equipment from their employees. Organizations like United Airlines are now requiring their staff to wear PPE, both in the gate area as well as on the airlines. To take a deeper dive, I wanted to focus a moment on schools and what will things look like for the schools potentially when they reopen here in the fall. It's recommended that students stay together across school days and groups of students do not mix. You'll see smaller class sizes uh, due to the fact that classrooms we'll need to rearrange the furniture to keep kids six feet apart. And that will be a minimum requirement. There's a possibility that you may see virtual only classes. Again, another possibility that every child inside of the elementary school will be required to wear some sort of a face covering made of cloth. You will see increased signage across the facility to educate visitors, students, and faculty members you may see some organizations have flexible sick leave policies for faculty and staff. One of the most important things that should be happening, and I can only encourage everyone to, to think about, is enhanced training, enhanced education, but more importantly, we need to verify that these individuals have gone through the training with some sort of a validation, whether it be a certification or a technology that can maintain that data, specifically for cleaning and disinfection of the entire facility. It doesn't stop just at the custodial level, the janitor level, or the, the certified professional level. It actually needs to take place with teachers, guidance counselors, principals, and any other staff member inside of the facility because cleaning is now a priority 
for everybody within that organization. So, so what will you see? Um, some types of signs that you have already started to see if you've gone out shopping. Uh, you may see COVID-19 prevention tips. So the things that you should do versus don't do. If you're entering in any sort of uh, doctor's office or hospital, you're gonna see signage that tells you to stop. You know, if you are feeling any of these symptoms, do not come in to our facility. They're trying to protect uh, the workers, the, the nurses, the, the frontline staff that are supporting their organization as well as other patients. Uh, and this one I got to kick out, this, this third picture, I was laughing this morning when I put this in here because you can see there's a floor sign about six feet away from the urinal, which I don't know any guy that could handle that kind of pressure, but I, I was laughing when I saw that. But that's an example of uh, floor signs that you see inside of retail, inside of schools. You will see more and more of these signs trying to eliminate um, people from going in within that six foot uh, diameter. I think companies right now are gonna go away anytime soon. Uh, I believe that you're gonna see continued signage, whether it's specific to COVID or future pandemics and, and outbreaks. So as we, as we begin talking a little bit deeper into this presentation, uh, we're gonna shift and focus about strategic decisions to rebuild consumer confidence. Uh, and, I, and I say this is strategic because it, this, this needs to come from a higher level. Um, we're seeing everybody um, out there trying to find their way. They don't have the answers. Um, they're Googling things. You know, they're, they're drinking all the different juices that are out there of misinformation. Um, but I think the first thing that we need to understand is really you know, what does your customer expect and, and what do they want? So consumers uh, specifically want a safe facility to visit. In times like this, um, you, myself, um, our friends at Hill and Marks, everybody is Googling uh, or going on the internet to find answers of how they can maintain a, a safe home or a safe workplace. So they're becoming more educated. They're becoming more engaged. They're becoming aware. So one of the things that they want to do is they, uh, the consumer wants to visually see employees cleaning for health. Um, historically, over the years, cleaning was done in the overnight hours when businesses were shut down. You're going to start to see a shift here where there's going to be more day porters and day cleaners. You're going to start seeing uh, retail store clerks being required to maintain the cleanliness levels and disinfection levels of high touch points, such as countertops, uh, door handles, light switches. And it, it won't be just the responsibility of the cleaning professional. Next, consumers want some sort of validation that employees have the skill set to remove harmful pathogens. Uh, there's many people with fake claims out there all over the internet, um, throughout the entire world for that matter, uh, that are just buying uh, technology and going out and, and spraying everything and claiming that they're killing harmful pathogens and they're doing things the right way, but there's no way to validate that. And finally, the consumers are really looking for a standardized methodology around processes and procedures for cleaning for harmful pathogens. Um, for those of you that are, have, have watched any TV commercials recently, you're probably seeing Delta Clean, United Clean, uh, Marriott Clean, and they're partnering with consumer brands of products, which is great. There's nothing wrong with that. But what happens from a consumer level is that they struggle they don't understand what is the best process, what is the best procedure. And then sometimes with these organizations, they contradict each other and the consumer is confused. So when we talk about strategic decisions for reopening your business, it really comes down to two things. As I mentioned, you can self-certify. So on one, on one hand, you can become Times Union clean. You can become Syracuse University clean, which is one direction. The other strategic decision you could make is how do you align with an objective third party accreditation program? Many of you have heard of LEED or Green Seal or any of the other certifying bodies that, are, that exist. And strategic thinkers and planners realize that they need to align themselves with these accreditation programs, with these certifying bodies, because consumers actually look at a facility when it's lead 
and they recognize that they are becoming more sustainable. They care about the environment. They care about our health and safety. And the same thing remains true today when it comes to cleaning and disinfecting. So we have some really uh, important concerns to think about here. And it's, it's how can we protect our building occupants today, right now, and for tomorrow, and for many, many months after? How do we clean and disinfect for infectious disease? This has been the number one question that we've been fielding at ISSA is, what products do I buy? What are the procedures that I follow? And where can I source the products? And last, what are the best practices for limiting the impact of future outbreaks and pandemics? And this is where uh, a beautiful partnership with Hill and Marks has come into play. And together with Hill and Marks and the ISSA division known as the Global Biorisk Advisory Council, Council has come together to help you prepare, respond, and right now recover from COVID-19. So the Global Biorisk Advisory Council has formed a program called GBAC STAR. And we feel that this is the, success, the successful 20 elements that you need to adhere to for reopening. But before we dive into those 20 steps, I wanted to highlight who created this program. And it was built by several scientists and doctors, um, starting first with Patty Ollinger, Gavin McGregor Skinner, Dr. Paul Meacham, Dr. Stefan Wagner. These individuals have uh, been closely consulting with the CDC, the World Health Organization, uh, the Canadian Health Organization, ABSA, Michigan State, and many more. These are the individuals uh, that are developing the processes and protocols for the entire world. Organizations such as Hyatt Hotels, the Miami Dolphins, and numerous NFL and MLB stadiums have signed on to this program because they recognize that these 20 elements are what ultimately are gonna make you successful to regain consumer confidence. <clears throat> we're not only talking about consumer confidence, but we're also discussing loyalty. Consumers now are buying products at places that they feel are safe and that they can trust. And as that, they will begin becoming loyal customers of yours and not going out to a competitor. competitor. So what is GBAC Star and what are these components? And we're gonna start diving into this because ultimately, together with Hill and Marks, we wanna provide you with the framework that you can adhere to to really ensure that your, your customers have a safe place. So the GBAC STAR program provides confidence, trust, and a third party validation for your facility. This is not an individual training, it's actually a per location uh, accreditation program. So, so what does this really mean to you? So let's start diving a little bit into the buckets. So, what we're hoping to do together with Hill and Marks and, and GBAC is to help you develop, if you have not have, uh, have them in place now, are the proper procedures. We wanna make sure that you have the proper training, the proper tools, the chemistry, the equipment, and make sure that you have the standardized PPE procedures in place um, that also line up with the CDC guidelines. And it seems that these are pretty common but oftentimes there's gaps within the chemistry, the tools, the equipment, and, and actually more importantly, there's bigger gaps in the SOPs, which we'll talk about here shortly. So as you can see, GBAC STAR uh, is really for any physical location. So you'll see some examples up here of organizations uh, that it would be meant for, such as Albany Medical Center or University of Syracuse, um, Hill and Marks actually applied and registered for the GBAC STAR last week, and they're in the middle of going through all of the compliance needed for these 20 elements. As mentioned, um, daycares, restaurants, hotels, churches, uh, any physical location um, can actually go through this process. And the accreditation program is designed for you to submit your processes, your protocols, and all of your paperwork to the Scientific Advisory Council with the help of Hill and Marks. 
And once we receive that paperwork, we're going to go through and provide a gap analysis and actually give you the resources and the knowledge to close your gaps. This is designed to make you stronger, have a safer facility for your consumers, and ultimately be able to go to your consumers with a wonderful marketing and communication plan to tell them what you're doing and how you're standardizing with the rest of the world. So moving into the 20 elements of success, and ladies and gentlemen, this is the framework for infectious disease control, uh, decontamination, disinfection, and cleaning. Across the board, these 20 elements are what are gonna make you successful for having a program that can ensure consumer confidence. Again, this is part of the strategic decision that you would need to make. So the first thing that you wanna have outlined is making sure that you have detailed and documented organizational structures that include roles, responsibilities, and the different levels of authority within the organization. Second, you wanna have a strong facility commitment statement, which means that you are committed to ensuring that you have a safe facility for consumers and for your employees. You wanna make sure that you have a sustainability and continuous improvement plan. The number one question that we're hearing uh, with, with the 20 elements is, you know, we haven't had any consumers and we've been shut down for months and months. Um, you know, what if, what if we're not using electrostatic sprayers or what if we're not using a specific chemical? The goal is that we get you there over time. And that's the continuous improvement plan is that you might not have the best program in place today, but we wanna help you get there over time. You wanna make sure that you remain compliant with your disinfection and infectious disease prevention program ongoing. Uh, you don't want to create something today just to appease the situation in the pandemic. You want to have something that is aligned for the future. You need to be successful ongoing. Next, we recommend that you create a list of goals, objectives, and all the multiple targets that are based on a risk assessment for your facility. Again, you want to rely on your partners to help you get through this from a third-party standpoint. Uh, so we really encourage you to build out a team of people that can help you shift your processes and your procedures to help you get through this. Uh, for the sixth element of success, you want to create a program and establish that program to ensure your prevention program uh, elements are being met. So really, what is the protocol that you are going to leverage to make sure that everything is being met consistently over the year? You wanna implement methods for ongoing risk assessments. You wanna, uh, and the mitigation strategies are in place to reduce the, and eliminate risks. Um, oftentimes we find that um, organizations will create a risk assessment plan, but they actually don't implement it and they don't uh, update it ongoing. Uh, it's just there in writing, but they're not actually going through the process. The, the eighth element of success, ladies and gentlemen, is probably our biggest gap that I've seen ever, uh, as long as I've been employed with ISSA, and it's the standard operating procedures. Many small businesses will simply create a checklist of things that need to be accomplished, but it doesn't specify task, it doesn't specify frequency, the products being used, the equipment being used, it simply says, take out the trash. It might not acknowledge what days of the week or times of the day. And I think uh, this for you, if, if you could hone in on one uh, key part of this entire element uh, is the SOP. This, it's so crucial for you to get this right. If you get this right, everything else will start falling into place. So for example, you'll need to make sure that you have the right tools and equipment to make sure that you are effective and efficient but that's outlined in the SOP. You wanna compile a list of cleaning and disinfecting chemicals. Um, again, uh, another gap here is that organizations don't understand the difference between cleaners, disinfectants, and sanitizers, and can often be a gap. Again, you really wanna rely on your subject matter experts, uh, whether it's Hill and Marks or ISSA or um, people in your, in your community that are doing things correctly. Uh, you really want to hone in on making sure that you're using the proper chemicals on the proper surfaces. 
The 11th element of success is establishing an inventory control plan for your supplies, your tools, and equipment. And the inventory control plan should consist of obviously the things that you currently have in your facility, but more importantly, you wanna make sure that you have roughly a three month supply of consumables, such as disinfectants and, and your cleaners. Um, the worst thing that could happen to you is that you are not maintaining a high enough level and you run out. And as many of you are aware, it's been very difficult uh, for most of the supply chain to keep up with the demand during the pandemic. And I'm not talking about hoarding uh, toilet paper here, but really simply having a good control plan in place. And the organizations that we work with at ISSA that had this uh, implemented prior to the pandemic never saw a hiccup in getting supplies because they were prepared. You want to establish a, and document a PPE policy for cleaning and disinfecting activities. What we're not saying here is uh, just general PPE for uh, safety of interacting with consumers. What we're talking about is your PPE policy for specifically cleaning and disinfecting. This would include any of your professional cleaners on staff, as well as any of your non-cleaning staff members that will be required to clean and disinfect surfaces inside of your facility. The 13th element here is to establish a plan for biomedical biohazardous waste management. Number 14, um, I, I'm a big advocate. I put it in bold because for me, uh, you can't invest enough into your people. Your people are what make your business. They keep your customers coming back. Uh, so for me, I, I felt this was one of the most important things next to making sure you have your SOPs documented. So what you really wanna do with this is you wanna have a policy and plan in place for training of cleaning technicians and non-cleaning employees and schedule that, right? So it's not scheduled just for today because of the pandemic, but creating that 12 month calendar of what you wanna do with your team. Um, and one of the really exciting things, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to tell you, but hopefully Jason is okay with this, is that Hill and Marks is launching an institute very soon to help you with training of your employees and provide some services that go above and beyond. Because we know uh, together, Hill and Marks and I to say that sometimes organizations struggle with the resources to do it themselves. We don't want you to fail. We want to support you through this. But ladies and gentlemen, number 14 is critical to your success. The 15th element of success is a documented emergency response plan. Most organizations have this in place already. Uh, and documented, so I, I anticipate that most of you would be able to adhere to that element. And the final set of elements uh, that we want to discuss today are to establish an infectious disease prevention program, a worker health program specific to infectious disease prevention. Number 18 is a, a plan for audits and inspections. Again, this is one of those areas where uh, organizations do a really nice job creating the plan for the audits, but they don't take the time to go out and perform the audits. And that's where the gap comes into play here. You want to establish a plan for all of your suppliers and vendors. Some of you on this call may outsource your cleaning program to a contract cleaner. Some of them may be in-house, but again, that would be a plan to control one of your vendors. You want to make sure any of your suppliers that you have plans to control and you have a process in place to order and manage that relationship. And the, the 20th element, uh, which typically is another one that people miss, is a management plan around all of your documentation. Um, oftentimes we have our documents spread all over the place and it would not take too terribly long to put together a plan to manage all of this. So this information that we're walking through here for the, for the 20 elements, ladies and gentlemen, are really focused on a framework to put together all of your documentation, your plans, protocols, and procedures. What Hill and Marks and ISSA and the Global Bio-Risk Advisory Council are not doing is checking the outcome. We want to help you build your structure for success. The exciting part for us is once you have this built, is how do you communicate this with your consumers? And now more than ever, they want constant communication. It goes above and beyond hanging a sign in the front window or the door. It's email campaigns, it's social media posts, it's networking, it's webinars. 
to let your consumers and your stakeholders know these are the things that we're doing to ensure that we have a safe facility for you to return to. Um, on that note, uh, I do want to talk about some additional resources uh, from Hill and Marks uh, as well as ISSA. But up on your screen, you're going to notice that there's several links here. And when you get a copy of this webinar recording, you'll be able to click right on these links. Uh, but there's information around the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, additional information around the Hill and Marks COVID. Um, documentation that's on their website, uh, information to the CDC, uh, the New York State Nobel Coronavirus page. Um, we encourage you to always stay in, in touch with your local health department. And then ISSA.com also has a landing page dedicated to everything related to COVID-19 as well. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to pause there, uh, Katie, if it's OK, because I would really like to have some dialogue with some of the individuals on the call and maybe talk through um, some Q&A with them if you'd like to help moderate that uh, as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, any of the people who are on this call, please feel free to either unmute yourselves and ask some questions or ask some questions in the chat box. Um, we are here to answer for you. We have some experts on the call. Our VP of Sales, Joe Waite, is on the call. C CEO of Helen Marks, Jason Packer, is on the call. So we have, you know, our experts here and ready to provide you with any insight you have, you need. And during that, Joe, if you want to talk about any specific dwell times, any specific things that customers should be, you know, any best practices that we should top it, uh, highlight right now, that would be great too. <laughs> Honestly, I've done so much crap. Like stuff's like, oh, have you done your phone? Like, should I come? I promise that wasn't me. <laughs> Brant, I have a question. This is Jason. Uh, for all of our customers or community people in the community, how do they? Um, you know, they can get the certification. But how do they make sure that their customers know about it and appreciate how important it, you know, how um, how important it is and and what it means to their safety? I mean, what's the best way to communicate that? Yeah, that's a great question, Jason. You know, we've we've had some talks with with Hyatt, the Dolphins, um, you know, many many organizations, and and they're actually putting together a whole marketing campaign. So. Not only are they going to hang a certificate or a window cling, uh, so things that are visible when they're in their facility, uh, but they're also creating email campaigns, social media posts, uh, and they're also looking at um, a new technology that's out there from an organization called Equip ID, which is a tagging system. And there's other organizations that do this, but where you could literally take, you know, your your Apple phone and just tag it to um, this RFID tag on the wall, and it'll tell the customer exactly that this organization is accredited and here's what it covers as well as verifying that the employees have been trained and certified for cleaning and disinfection inside the facility um, so they're trying to leverage technology as well which i think is is remarkable and it just goes to show that uh, validation is extremely important right now for consumers we did get a question one of the earlier charts with the urinal Stated under don'ts, don't wear a face mask unless showing symptoms. To whom is that applicable? In the food service? Question mark. Yeah, so that was one of the, um, I think that was one of the slides I showed. That was a CDC um, uh, document there. So I would re actually refer you back to the CDC guidelines just to verify that. But that was just a screenshot that I took from their, their website. But right now, I believe, Katie, too, that a lot of the recommendations coming from CDC are that people wear a face mask if you're within six feet or if you cannot maintain social distancing. And that's just been the common um, recommendation coming out from everybody across the board. Absolutely. Any more questions? Feel free to enter in the chat or unmute yourselves. So I would actually like to ask a question, Katie, of Joe, if that's okay. Absolutely. So, Joe, we're hearing a lot of questions at ISSA, and I'd love for you as a subject matter expert at Hill Marks to maybe touch on this for everybody. You know, we're getting a lot of questions of people saying, you know, how do I actually use a chemical uh, from start to finish? For example, some people spray a surface directly, some spray a cloth, some people don't allow dwell time, and so on. 
Um, so maybe you could touch on that a little bit for everybody. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely, Brent. Um, you know, when it, come, when it comes to learning about a chemical program, it, it really starts with understanding what the function is and, and being properly trained on it. So, you know, we continue to talk about how we're going to reopen and, and how we're going to do that safely and, and what do I use because there's so many disruptions in the supply chain. And, you know, whether you're using um, a dilution control product or a ready to use product or a wipe, um, you know, they, they, they each have specific functions, but, but the important thing to understand is that a lot of those products are multifunctional and, and there's different ap application processes and, and there's different components that go into it um, and different dwell times. So to your, to your question, Grant, you know, uh, what, what's the proper way to, to apply a disinfectant on a surface? If you're looking to disinfect a surface, the first thing that you need to do is make sure that that surface is free of any debris. Because if you're gonna properly disinfect any surface, um, you can't disinfect dirt or a soil load. So, so you have to make sure that it's clean first. Uh, the best thing to do would be to spray it on a, on a cloth, preferably a microfiber rag, uh, and, and wipe down the surface and make sure that that surface stays wet for the recommended period of time. Uh, you can spray it. The problem with spraying it is you're disrupting whatever's on that surface. So the pressure from the spray is going to pretty much make everything that's there airborne. Um, so you want to make sure that you're referring to SDS sheets, uh, the, the product labels that are on the bottle to, to identify what the proper dwell time is, because if it doesn't stay wet for that period of time, um, you're not properly disinfecting that surface. So, and the reason why different dwell times are different is because different products have different kill claims. So there's a lot of products on the market that, that have a kill claim for coronavirus that, that may be two minutes, some may be four minutes, some may be 10 minutes, but they're killing everything else in between that as well. So if you have a product that, that has a, a 10 minute kill claim for, for COVID-19, uh, they may have a kill claim for the common cold in 30 seconds. So that's kind of where that spectrum comes into play. Um, you know, when we talk about electrostatic sprayers, so there, there's a lot of electrostatic sprayers on the market. Um, and, and it's really important to understand the product that's going into that as well. There, there's different variations to those electrostatic sprayers. Uh, they're meant to be used with specific products. So, you know, and the reason why they're meant to be used with specific products is because they're tested with those products. And if you if you just put any chemical solution into an electrostatic sprayer, you don't really know what it's actually doing because it's it's not backed up or supported by any data performed on that on that equipment. So, um, you know, when we talk about the supply chain with it, and and you know, we have our our VP of uh, purchasing on the line too. The one thing that that we've experienced is you know, the, the need for all of these things, right? So, you know, when this thing hit, everybody wanted wipes, everybody wanted hand sanitizer, everybody wanted, um, um, you know, whatever disinfectant they may be using. And, and I'm trying to keep this as vague as possible because there's multiple products that are available. But um, the key is to understand that there's multiple products that can be used to help prevent this. It's just understanding um, what's available, how to properly use it, safely um, and, and make sure that uh, that the dwell time is being adhered to because if it isn't uh, you're doing uh, you're doing yourself a disservice does that answer your question Brent? it, it does and, and, and i wanted to just tie that back to it i believe it was uh maybe like step 14 or something in those 20 elements but guys on the call when you really think about this what what joe just explained to you needs to be tied into the scope of work um, as detailed as possible providing job cards uh, and, and specify step by step with your uh, cleaning professionals and non cleaning professionals that may not be familiar with the cleaning disinfection process. You know, they, they need to know every single thing step by step. And, and Joe, I love how you talked, you know, a lot about electrostatic sprayers and disinfectants um, because there's a major difference between the chemicals that you, you mentioned as well as going from a single step to a two step cleaning and disinfection process. So, um, really understanding what you're using uh, is, is crucial. Brant, I have a, another question. This is Jason. Um, so the one thing we're learning as we go through the GBAC program is it's really important to have like a, a, a leader, somebody who's going to take charge of this, this process and somebody who understands um, 
uh, disinfection, understands cleaning. Um, how do you recommend this get, you know, what is, who should be involved? What what uh, group of people or task force should be involved in uh, implementing the GBAC program? Yeah, um, I, I know Joe has probably got uh, his hands full right now for your team, but, you know, we really recommend inside of the facility someone that is in a leadership position um, to own the project first and to tie in people from multiple departments. Uh, so, for example, let's pretend that we're a hotel you're going to want to have maybe the general manager leading the way because that top down approach is really what makes this effective. Uh, then you bring in somebody from environmental services or the cleaning team uh, to help with maybe the SOP part. When it comes to inventory control and managing your suppliers and vendors, you want to pull in somebody from the finance side. Uh, we recommend that you build out a team where each person on the team could take one or two of each of these elements to pull everything together. Uh, but essentially that one point person that's in a supervisor or management level is the one that provides the data to the GBAC Scientific Advisory Council for review. Uh, the one thing that you don't want to do is have everybody putting in their documentation into the portal and then owning the documentation. It needs to be in one central location. Some organizations are leveraging their operations department for that central locations, and then smaller businesses are leveraging their human resources team. For that is GBAC for everybody I mean you may have a smaller company on here you may have a very large organization like a school district or a university on here you may have a county I mean is it for everybody or is it meant specific you know I, can it can a smaller business like a restaurant do it to give consumers confidence that they they are safe walking into that organ into that building yeah, so to answer your, uh, your question directly, it's open to anybody. Uh, where I see it being the most beneficial is in communities. Uh, we're currently working with the city of Dallas, the city of Baltimore, uh, Anaheim, uh, Dana Point, I mean, all over. And the cities and the communities are recognizing how important this is because a small restaurant that may have 40 or 50 seats has the same exact problems and concerns around consumer confidence that maybe a Delmonico's with a couple hundred um, seats or you know, 500 seats. Um, so when you, when you think about it, Jason, it's really meant for everybody, but we wanna think about the chain. So if, you know, if, if Hyatt is, is doing it and then you go down the street and AMC movie theater is not, and they're doing their own thing, the consumer journey is broken because they don't see anything that's standardized across the board. Um, so whether you're a small uh, ice cream shop or if you're a large hotel chain or restaurant chain, um, it's it's designed on scale based on the size of the organization. Uh, it's extremely cost effective. It's not designed to push people away. It's designed to be inclusive. We want as many people into the program as possible to create a standardized uh, consumer confidence across the board as they take their journey. So if, um, like, for example, if a, a YMCA, say there are, you know, 20 YMCA buildings in our in our region, do they come together to get involved in GBAC or do they, does each building do it independently? How do you, how do you, uh, how do they work on that with you? Yeah, so it's, it's really either or. Um, I would recommend from a strategic level, you want them all to be the same, right? They all have that same brand. Um, early on, Jason, we recognize uh, quickly uh, with some of the hotel chains is that some of those are uh, franchised out. So the franchisee could say, we want to do it, but the rest of the corporation doesn't. And then as soon as corporate found out or their head office, they basically, they basically said as a protocol, we want all of the hotels to go through the program. So from a corporate level, they made that decision, which made life a lot easier and consistent. All right, do we have any more questions? I'll ask one more question actually. How long would you anticipate if, if everybody's you know committed to this and there's uh, buy-in from all stakeholders and uh, everybody's you know working on it, how long do you think it would take for an organization to get this up and running and certified? So when you, when you take a look at that journey and pathway through the accreditation program, It'll take maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes to fill out the application. 
Uh, once that happens, you receive your guidebook, your handbook, and all the templates. The longest part starts there, and that's for the organizations that aren't aligned with the, the processes or they're not aligned with all the documentation. So we anticipate that taking anywhere from three to five weeks uh, if somebody's not uh, really aligned. Those organizations like uh, Royal Caribbean or some of these other bigger brands that have a lot of processes in place, uh, they're going to move through this a lot quicker uh, just for the simple fact that they have the documentation. So on average, we're anticipating four to six weeks. Uh, this is a brand new program that launched a little over two weeks ago and uh, has seen uh, tremendous market adoption. So Katie and Joe, the, if, if anybody is interested in learning more and how it would fit into their organization, they should go to info at hillmarks.com. Is that the best avenue at this point? Yes, yeah, so we will be having a banner on our homepage um, where you guys can click the, all you have to do is click the banner. It will bring you right to the um, registration form on ISSA's website and then use the form, the coupon code Hill and Marks and we'll be able to make sure everything's tracked. We'll be able to be in contact with you and make sure that you guys are all set. So that would be the best way to register for the GBAC star accreditation at this time. And I'd, I'd just like to add to as well, and, and Brad, you've included the, the links uh, to, to the checklist that, that we've, we've worked on together, not only with ISSA, but we also have a Helen Marks checklist. There's a lot of questions uh, from our customers about what products they're gonna need to reopen, specific products that they're going to need to reopen. And I think the purpose of this webinar today wasn't wasn't designed to to make it, um, you know, manufacturer specific and and uh, you know a specific pitch for any one item. But really, the premise is is to give you guys a better understanding of the process that's behind it to to help give you guys the support you need and and some tools to look for to to reopen reopen safely um, for your for you for your customers and for your staff. So. Take a look at those checklists. If, the, if there's anything on those that you guys have questions about, reach out to us, uh, happy to help. And uh, that's it for me. Hope everybody enjoys a Memorial Day weekend. It's gonna be a nice one. Absolutely. And Thanks. we did have someone write in a comment, can you make the sample checklist available or where can I find them? Yes, we will make sure it's available for you. We will send it in the follow-up email from this webinar and um, I can also send it directly to you so you have it available in a PDF form, and it's also available on our website and social media. So I Brand, would like to go ahead, Jason. Sorry, one last question. Um, we have seven minutes, but Brant, do you, do you envision GBAC as something that people are, you know, in the next three to five years are going to say, um, I, I'm either going to go into your organization or I'm not based on the fact you have some kind of certification, whether it's GBAC or some other and I don't, I don't mean to plant the seed here, but maybe there's a competitor to it. But, you know, is the certification going to be something that organizations are going to need in order to attract customers, keep customers, and, and, and not just customers, but employees to feel comfortable walking into a building saying, hey, my, my employer has got my back. They're doing everything possible to keep me safe. Do you see that as like where this is going? I mean, it's it's new. It's you know you just launched it uh, over the past few weeks, but do you envision that we're, that's where we're going? Yeah, I think you're you're right on the money, Jason. You know, there's been thousands and thousands of people that are buying into this. I mean, even taxi cabs and limousines to believe it or not, porta potties. I mean, everybody, whether it's um, you know a physical structure or one that can be moved. Um, it, it's going to become more of a requirement in a policy. And one thing I, I, I neglected to mention is if you think about the younger generation, uh, and we're on that, that cusp of the millennial generation, a lot of times as employees, we would look at a company to see what charitable arms they have, are they mission driven, before we even wanted to go there as an employee. Um, I think you're going to see that start to shift a little bit. That's still a piece of it. But they're going to also start looking at, you know, are my workstations clean and disinfected? Is it safe for me to be in that environment? That's going to continue to happen. Uh, it's It's been around, but not as dominant. Um, and I think, you know, if there's any light uh, or uh, positive outcomes to the pandemic here, it's that, again, that our industry is is finally not being looked at as a cost center, but it's it's really a requirement now. 
and more and more people are now seeing this as mandatory. Uh, and the organizations that we're talking with, Jason and, and Joe and Katie and, and the rest of the people on the call are um, people like the NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, NHL, uh, all of the associations for hospitality and lodging and um, venue managers and so on. Every single one of them are saying that we want to make this a requirement. Uh, it's really been uh, quite amazing to watch. Uh, and this was just a stat that Jason and I shared with some people on a call yesterday is that when this, when this launched, uh, our team has been on Good Morning America. There's been over 8 million impressions. Uh, we've been on over 300 different channels. And I'm not saying that to toot the horn of ISSA or GBAC, but to show you that the consumers are raising their hand and they're saying, now is the time. We need to have that reassurance that it's going away for the next three to five years. Because again, these pandemics and, and, and issues are cyclical. So something else will come up, you know, whether it's in the near future or long term, but they're going to need stability. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Brand. It's been really informative and I really uh, urge anybody on this, everybody on this call to take a look at it. I think it's um, it will put you a step ahead of your competition um, to be out there, not only for your employees, but your customers. Um, and uh and and brand and hill and marks are there to help you support you through it um so that's that's what i have to say about it and thank you for coming on the call and katie if you want to sure. summarize and move yeah. on. thank you to everyone who spent some time with us this morning to go over this a huge thank you to brant and all of the team at issa for their support throughout this time um helen marks will continue to be a consultant and a support system for all of you on this call and i also want to thank the chambers so much for being such a great community member and sharing expertise and giving tons of information to their members and, and the community. So thank you guys for helping us and collaborating with us on this. And this will be available to download and rewatch on the Helen Marks website. We will send it in an email as well to all who have signed up. And thank you so much. Enjoy your Memorial Day weekend and the sun and get a little R&R. &R. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.